Hi, my name is Holly, and I'm a Cree and Scottish Métis woman in Alberta, Canada. My European ancestors came from Scotland to Canada with the Hudson's Bay Company to join the fur trade in the 1700s. I grew up always knowing that I was a Métis person, but I never really knew what that meant until I got curious about my culture in my 20s. With my curiosity came some big questions, like what does it mean to be Métis? Who are the Métis people? and what was important to my ancestors. In this series, I invite you to join me on my journey of reconnecting and learning about what it means to be Métis. This is Modern Métis Canada. Thousands of years ago, long before Canada was recognized as a country, the land was inhabited by First Nations people who had communities, spiritual beliefs, and social hierarchies. The Plains First Nations people worked together as a band to provide for their community. They depended on the hunters and trappers of the group for survival and thrived primarily off of meat, fish, and plants for food, as well as medicine. Oftentimes, the leader of the community gained his status by exhibiting great courage or skill in hunting and having profound knowledge about seasonal migrations and the habitats of the animals that they depended on for survival. One of the main animals that they depended on for survival was the buffalo. The buffalo would be seen as the primary goal of the hunt, and a single buffalo would provide an average of 700 kilograms of meat. And then the woman would prepare the animal skins and use a smoke tanning process to preserve the hides to create clothing such as fur coats, tunics, leggings, and moccasins. The First Nations people were deeply spiritual and believed that their traditions and consciousness were a gift from the Creator. They believed that the people should live in unity with the earth and all that it possessed. They had profound gratitude and respect for the natural world and would celebrate with song, dance, festivals and ceremonies. The people would give thanks to nature and the elders would pass on stories from one generation to the next about how the world came to be and how they were part of the entire creation. The First Nations peoples populated these lands for thousands of years before European explorers arrived on the eastern shores in the 11th century. The explorers arrived and settled, developing North America's first European colony, which eventually became known as Newfoundland. In the 1500s, the European explorers were attracted back to the eastern shores after hearing stories about the wealth of resources that this new world offered. They developed a web of colonies throughout the land that had a trading system with the First Nations people to exchange European goods for furs. This began the history of colonization and the fur trade in the land that we now know as Canada. While the colonization of Canada has a very dark history, the arrival of these European fur traders was able to breathe life into a new type of Indigenous group, the Métis people. The Métis people were born through marriages between the First Nations women and European fur trader men in the 18th century and are commonly known as the children of the fur trade. Over time, the children would go on to form a new culture, a thriving community, and nationhood. The Métis people developed communities along the fur trade routes, and that created the Métis Nation homeland. The homeland in Canada today includes British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and the Northwest Territories. The Métis people were often characterized by their high mobility, and the first Métis settlements were occupied seasonally, 
as the settlements had to adapt to the changing seasons. The settlement locations were often associated with a connection to the fur trade, buffalo hunting, fishing, and transportation systems. In the springtime, Métis people could be found hunting birds like ducks, geese, swans, and pheasants. This is also the time that they would hunt male moose, male deer, and prairie grizzlies. They would catch fish such as pike, walleye, and sturgeon with nets, spears, or traps. They will also hunt smaller animals like otters, beavers, rabbits, coyotes, and wolves. They collected birch bark to make canoes and household items, tap birch and maple trees, and seed wheat and other grains. In the summertime, the Métis people would be hunting bison in order to pay off the debts to the Hudson Bay Company that was incurred during the winter season and to restock their food supplies. They would hunt wolves, coyotes, bear, moose, and deer and gather berries such as blueberries, raspberries, Saskatoon berries, and choke cherries. During the fall season, they would hunt bison, moose, deer, and migratory ducks, geese, and swans. They would fish for spawning fish, like whitefish and salmon, using weirs, nets, spears, or traps. And they would trap bears, wolves, coyotes, and rabbits, and harvest wild rice, Saskatoon berries, cranberries, and wheat. During the winter, they would trap weasels, skunks, otters, beavers, foxes, and lynx, and they would ice fish with nets and hunt bison in the winter camps. The Métis people, just like other Indigenous people, passed along their histories and legends and family remembrances through oral traditions and storytelling. Traditional Métis stories can indicate what family a Métis person is from and they can include narratives about spirits, tricksters, creation, and morality. Trickster stories are generally told in a humorous manner and talk often about creation. The tricksters are often good characters who have human flaws like gluttony and selfishness. There are also stories about magical people, monsters, tall tales, and fairy tales. There are also dark stories about shapeshifters and bad people. These stories were to, used to ensure that the youth behaved themselves. The traditional language of the Métis people is called Michif, which is a combination of French language, Cree, and other indigenous languages. Unfortunately, the colonization of Canada has had a devastating impact on the Métis collective identity particularly through the near eradication of Métis heritage languages. Michif is an endangered language with less than 1,200 people in Canada who have identified that they can have a conversation in Michif. When a language dies and is forgotten, we lose unique culture and perception of the world. We lose memories and we lose history. The Métis Nation is working to preserve the language to attempt to keep the rich oral tradition, healing traditions, spiritual systems, values, and harvesting strategies. Today, passing on the Michif language to young people is a concern that many Métis people, Michif speakers, and Métis institutions have, such as the Gabriel Dumont Institute and the Louis Riel Institute are producing Michif language books, music, and websites to keep the language alive. The colonization of Canada also led to several resistances and battles for the Métis people. The Red River Resistance of 1869 and 1870 began as a response to the largest land sale in history. The Hudson's Bay Company sold Rupert's Land to the Dominion of Canada for $1.5 million without consulting its Indigenous residents. Rupert's Land covered much of the Métis Nation homeland spanning from northern Quebec, northern Ontario, and most of the three prairie provinces like Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. The Métis were surprised at this attempt transfer of their homeland and felt that the Hudson Bay did not possess the right to sell this territory. The Métis people challenged this sale and formed its own provisional government that was led by Louis Riel. 
The provisional government negotiated with the Dominion government and drafted a list of rights based on the Manitoba Act of 1870. This act became law in May 1870 and included provisions for bilingual denominational schools, judicial and parliamentary systems, and measures to address their Indian title to the land. In July 1870, Manitoba became Canada's fifth province, and shortly after, in August 1870, a Red River force was sent from Ottawa to pacify the region. When this happened, a reign of terror came for the Métis people and created an intolerable climate of violence and fear, which caused more than half of the Métis people of Manitoba to flee to other territories, such as the Northwest Territories. The Métis script system was implemented after the 1869 and 1870 Red River resistance. The Canadian government created Manitoba under the Manitoba Act, which set aside 1.4 million acres of land for the Métis families. Once the land was exhausted, the Métis government supplemented it through script distribution to individuals. There were two types of script that were created, land script and money script. When the system was first implemented, the value of script provided to the Métis was either 160 acres of land or $160 of cash that could be used to purchase land. The value later increased to 240 acres or $240. The script system was flawed in many ways and resulted in the systematic loss of Métis lands. The script was advertised in newspapers and posters to alert speculators and there was no protection against fraud. Many Métis people had their names forged without their knowledge, and land speculators bought scrip from Métis people at very low prices, and then sold the land back to the Bank of Canada. Out of the 14,849 scripts issued, land speculators ended up obtaining 12,560 of the scripts and managed to leave the Métis with only 1% of the acres of land scrip issued. This proceeded into the years 1883 and 1884, when the Métis further determined to press the government for their rights. The Métis leaders of the Northwest Territories held gatherings where they sought ways to recognize their rights as people and drew up a list of grievances to send to Ottawa. The list of grievances was delivered to Ottawa in 1884 and demanded that the Northwest Territories become a province with a fully responsible government, that the Métis people would be granted title to their lands, and that Louis Riel's leadership would be formally recognized. The government responded that it would not negotiate with Louis Riel, which caused the outbreak of the 1885 Northwest Resistance. After many battles, like the Battle of Duck Lake in March 1885 that was led by Gabriel Dumont, the Battle of Fish Creek in April 1885, and the Battle of Batoche in May 1885, Louis Riel was executed in November 1885. After the 1885 Northwest Resistance, the Métis people were defeated, and the outcome for the Métis people in Western Canada would be bleak. First Nations people were forced to stay on reserves, their children were sent to residential schools to be assimilated, the Métis people were dispersed from their traditional lands and would face very difficult choices about their places in this new society. The Métis people were stigmatized as rebels and traitors and faced unending racism for being Indigenous and were forced to hide their Indigenous identity and identify themselves as French, French-Canadian or Scottish to escape racism for their own cultural safety. Some Métis people dispersed to parkland, others squatted on crown land that was used or intended to be used for the creation of roads in rural areas. As a result, the Métis people began to be called the road allowance people as they settled in dozens of makeshift communities throughout the prairie provinces. 
Road Allowance houses reflected the Métis' extreme poverty. Houses were uninsulated, roofed with tar paper, and built from discarded lumber and other various recycled materials. These small one- or two-room houses would provide shelter for an entire family. Road Allowance communities were usually located in areas where there were temporary opportunities for employment. The Métis people worked for farmers making minimal wages or being paid in food for labour jobs and were not able to afford their homes or pay rent. To supplement their income, many road allowance families picked berries and roots, grew gardens, and trapped and hunted game to be sold by the pound. But unfortunately, in 1939, it became illegal to hunt and trap out of season without a license which caused many Métis people to be imprisoned and pay expensive fines for hunting out of season. In many cases, the animals that they were hunting were the only source of food. The road allowance Métis people already had a very low standard of living. They were marginalized, they had poor health, and a lack of viable employment opportunity. They also lacked educational opportunities because the children were not allowed to go to school if the parents did not pay property taxes. As a result, three generations of Métis people were unable to receive a basic education. Though a lot has changed from then until now, the Métis people still continue to face challenges in modern day Canada. Many current Métis people have been raised in a way of hiding their Indigenous culture, which has led to the loss of heritage and memories. Modern Métis people are still reconnecting with what their culture was before the colonization of Canada, and many Métis people are still struggling with poverty, health, and education. Many Métis people still struggle with their identity and feel that they're not recognized as Indigenous people as they're not status natives. Métis people are still marginalized and experience racism, social displacement, and economic marginalization. The Métis people are innovative in nature and adaptive. Being from both indigenous and settler traditions, the Métis have always had the ability to live in two worlds and have been able to adapt to changing circumstances. While the forgotten people lived under the radar for more than 100 years, the Métis people started to make a comeback in 1980 and are now one of Canada's fastest growing demographics. The Métis people of today are sharing their talents with the world and are strengthening the Métis culture. They are demonstrating the vibrancy and resiliency of the Métis people and will continue to share their journey through storytelling and art. In the future, it is hoped that progress will be made in the struggle of having the Métis people being fully recognized as the founding people of Canada. And the Métis people will continue to fight for their place in the world and share their culture with the future generations. Join me for the next episode, where I will be speaking to our special guests, Ross Pambram and Michael Broadfoot, while we dig into music in the Métis culture. But often, like when we think about Métis people, you know, we often will say, you know, our Métis people will be thought of as like only half native, you know what I mean? Like there's still this blood quantum race, racial association and, and while I don't think that is true, I do think it is true to the experiences that we have in our society that people think about us and treat us like this and we even think about ourselves like this, you know, like being disconnected from my culture as a Métis, as a native person, uh, as a Cree person, you know, I didn't really always feel like I knew how to how to make that connection, and um, it felt like to me that I could start to explore who I am as a Native person through making uh, hip hop. Like I could be a Native person on the mic, sort of thing. Boy, the. The easy answers for me sometimes come when somebody asks me about music. And I love when that topic comes back around. My dad and his dad had always played instruments. And though I never really got to know my granddad, there's, there's, always, there's always a few stories out there of musicians and, 
and how their lifestyles and traveling. I like to think that when my dad picked up that awareness, it was important to him. And I've seen pictures of my granddad and I look and I go, boy, I sure do look like that old man. And now I look at my own dad and I see that he's played the guitar his whole life and he played the fiddle his whole life. The Métis people have always celebrated and, you know, at the end of the, the holiday seasons and the new year, there would always be a Métis kitchen party. And I came to realize that if you're holding a guitar, people want to dance. And I love being around where people want to dance. But there's a difference between when it's your band. And it wasn't my idea, but it was the guys that I have been playing with, and they're all heavy hitters out there. And they had said, you know what? We tried a few different names, but what we're going to try is something that identifies kind of you as the singer, but then there's a whole band behind you. And that's Memphis and the Grand, G-R-A-N-D-E. And they liked that sort of connection. But they said, the other thing we don't want you to lose, Ross, is we don't want you to lose that connection you have with community. And when we've played lots of Métis events, just as much as we played every other event, played every other culture, and played a lot of different bars. But then they said, well, you know what? Why don't you put a little bit of symbolism? It's either for you, or it might also be for somebody else. And this gives the youth, gives the elders a chance to see that it's okay to have identity. It doesn't change the music. Oh, we're still boot stomping and country rock and roll, and it's a lot of our own stuff, and we're having our time of our lives as we're playing. But, you know, that brings a little something back to my heart when I get to, you know, wear the bright, shining uh, Louis Riel colors that are hanging on me. And when, when we get to play music, there's a little bit of spirit there that I get to stay involved with. When they dance together, it's in the kitchen. With the lights on low as the radio plays. It's his time she has with him that makes it the best part of her day. Well, it's nothing glamorous to anyone who could see them move across the floor but each song would leave lovers want to share but one more she feels him look into her Betty Davis eyes and in a few turns and a smile he replies when you first placed your hand in mine girl I wanted to dance you for all time and there's nothing outside of this grace they share for each other in a room that seems so busy they plan one day to another there are a few marks on the floor but she's never cared each mark represents another dance they share she feels him look into her Betty Davis eyes and in a few turns and a smile he replies when you first placed your hand in mine girl I wanted to dance you girl I wanted to dance you girl I wanted to dance you for all time. <laughs> Thank you, Holly, for that. <laughs>